prepare yourself for the tragic expedition into the realm of killer well attacks as we unravel the gripping stories of individuals who found themselves in the jaws of danger. From the heart-pounding attack on trainer Steve Abel to the harrowing encounter on Jonathan Smith, each tale offers terrifying insight into the raw power and unpredictability of orcas. Prepare yourself for the tragedies amongst nature's most misunderstood marine predators, the orca. Sea World trainer John Sillick swam gracefully with a large grin on his face as he was doing a routine show with his two trusted orcas. But his grin quickly turned to panic as he was unknowingly going to experience a horrific accident that would scar him for life. During his live performance, Sillick was riding atop a female orca named Corky in what seemed like an everyday regimen when suddenly he was thrust and body slammed by another orca, Orky 2. The crowd watched in pure horror as Orky leapt out of the water, crashing onto Sillick and Corky, causing Sillick to suffer a fractured vertebrae, femur, and pelvis, which would leave him in a wheelchair for life. This is the shocking story of the orca attack on John Sillick. John grew up in a small town on the coast and was always a curious child, poking around tide pools and collecting seashells on the beach. In school, John was an average student. He wasn't at the top of the class, but he wasn't at the bottom either. He had a knack for science and loved learning about the ocean and its inhabitants. After high school, John decided to pursue his passion for marine biology. He enrolled in college and spent four years studying everything from fish anatomy to ocean currents. He was always happiest when he was out on the water, conducting research for his classes. During his college years, John landed a part-time job at a local aquarium. It was there that he got his first taste of working with marine animals up close. He fed the fish, cleaned the tanks, and even helped with educational programs for visitors. After graduating, John was eager to dive into his career. He landed a job at SeaWorld, where he worked as a marine mammal trainer, most with orcas and dolphins. It was a dream job come true for John, who always had been fascinated by these animals. At SeaWorld, John spent his days working with the animals, teaching them new tricks, and caring for their well-being. He formed a special bond with many of the creatures under his care, spending hours getting to know their unique personalities. But life at SeaWorld wasn't always easy. The job could be demanding with long hours and physical labor. Despite the challenges, John loved every minute of it. He felt like he was making a difference in the lives of the animals that he worked with, and that was all that mattered to him. Orky 2 and Corky 2 lived vastly different lives, but intertwined within the confines of SeaWorld San Diego. Their story shed light on the complexities of captivity for marine mammals. Orky 2 was a male northern resident killer whale, captured in 1968 at around six years of age from Pender Harbor, British Columbia. He spent two decades entertaining crowds at SeaWorld San Diego before his untimely death due to health complications. Orky's life was marked by several behavioral incidents. His legacy, however, extends beyond these incidents as he played a significant role in SeaWorld's performance for many years. Corky II, on the other hand, was born in 1965 in the chilly Pacific waters of British Columbia. At the age of four, she experienced the trauma of capture, witnessing seven members of her family being taken away from the entertainment industry. She was hoisted out of the sea and transported to marine land on the Pacific, where she was reunited with other captive whales. Corky's life was marked by numerous pregnancies, none of which resulted in surviving calves. Despite her struggles, she remained a kind and patient soul, known for modifying her behavior to protect inexperienced trainers. In 1987, Corky was transferred to SeaWorld San Diego, where she continued to perform and interact with trainers. Despite her age and failing health, she remained a beloved figure at the park. However, her captivity sparked controversy with calls for her release back to her family pod in the wild. The contrast in lives of Orky and Corky underscores the ethical dilemmas surrounding the captivity of orcas for entertainment purposes. While Orky's story is marked by his role in SeaWorld's performances and the incidents that occurred during his tenure, Corky's story is one of resilience and compassion in the face of adversity. 
Both orcas serve as reminders of the impact of captivity on marine mammals and the need for greater protection for these intelligent creatures. John was often with the animals during performances, and in a shocking incident in 1987, a massive orca named Orky II leapt out of the water, body slamming John. The terrifying moment was captured on video, and has resurfaced online, reigniting discussions about the safety of trainers and the ethics of keeping marine mammals in captivity. During a performance at the San Diego Park, John was riding a female orca, Corky II, as part of a trick. The audience watched in horror as Orky, a 1,200-pound male orca, propelled himself out of the water, crashing down onto him and Corky. Silik was crushed under the weight of the orca and was lucky to survive the ordeal. However, he suffered severe injuries, including a fractured pelvis, femur, and ribs. The incident left him in a wheelchair, facing a long road to recovery. In the aftermath of the attack, questions arose about what could have triggered Orky's aggressive behavior. Some speculate that he may have been jealous or angry, while others point to a possible sexual activity involving the orcas before the show. Animal behaviorists and marine mammal experts weighed in, suggesting that it's essential for trainers to be able to read the signals of the animals they work with. Signs of agitation or anger, such as a change in eye color, should be taken seriously to prevent such incidents from occurring. Unfortunately, the attack on John was not an isolated incident at SeaWorld. He was only one of many other trainers who were attacked and some even tragically killed by captive orcas. When SeaWorld first opened, it was the only theme park where people could go to see marine mammals up close and personal. It was a popular destination, especially for families looking for a fun day out. But behind the scenes, there was a growing controversy about how they treated the animals. The attack on John Silik was one of the main eye-openers that turned the public eye towards their practices. One of the main issues was the orcas. In the wild, orcas are highly intelligent and social creatures, known for close family groups and complex behaviors. But at SeaWorld, they were kept in small tanks and forced to perform tricks for the entertainment of visitors. Animal rights activists argued that this was cruel and unnatural, causing stress and psychological harm to the orcas. They pointed to incidents of aggression and even violence between the captive orcas and their trainers as evidence of the negative effects of captivity. In addition to the treatment of orcas, there was also concerns about the welfare of other animals at SeaWorld, including dolphins, sea lions, and penguins. Critics argued that these animals were also kept in inadequate conditions and forced to perform unnatural behaviors for the entertainment of visitors. SeaWorld, for its part, defended its practices claiming that its animals received the highest standard of care and that their primary goal was conservation and education. They pointed to their efforts to rescue and rehabilitate injured marine animals and their support for research and conservation projects around the world. The aftermath of the Yorka attack on John Silik in 1987 sparked a massive debate about responsibility and safety protocols within the marine park industry. Initially, SeaWorld declined any responsibility for the incident, attributing it to trainer error, and they even later dismissed claims made in Blackfish as misleading and fake. Some SeaWorld trainers expressed skepticism about the portrayal of the incidents in Blackfish, highlighting what they saw as misinformation and omissions in the film. They argued that the incident was not an act of aggression by the orca, but rather a result of a poor judgment called by Silic during a rehearsed routine. According to them, Silik's decision to ride the orca for a second perimeter, facing backwards, disrupted the timing of the send signal given to another whale, leading to the accident. They emphasized that SeaWorld had developed formal protocols for waterwork interactions to minimize trainer discretion and ensure safety in the years following the incident. Jeff Ventry, another former SeaWorld trainer, admitted in an email that the Silik accident was not an act of whale aggression but rather a result of a trainer being in the wrong place. However, despite these assertions, Blackfish portrayed the incident as an act of aggression, contributing to public outrage and calls for reform within the marine park industry. On the other hand, SeaWorld's response to the accident on Silic and other incidents involving trainers has been met with criticism from former employees like Samantha Berg. 
Berg argued that there is nothing accidental about injuries or deaths involving trainers or marine mammals, attributing them to the stressors of captivity and inadequate safety measures. She claimed that trainers are kept in the dark about the risk of working with large predators like killer whales and are not adequately informed about animal health issues or the real dangers they face. Berg's comments raised questions about SeaWorld's transparency and its commitment to ensuring the safety and well-being of its trainers and marine mammals. In the end, SeaWorld changed its practices, but it was only after decades. It took countless injuries and even the death of a trainer for them to finally cease the orca breeding program in 2016. Should SeaWorld suffer more punishment? How do we stop people from exploiting wild animals for entertainment? Our thoughts are reserved, but maybe another orca tale could give answers. Jonathan Smith was only 21 years old when he took the stage and swam with Kandu, the mighty orca. He had his skepticism initially, but despite that, he was reassured of his safety by other SeaWorld officials. But soon he would quickly realize that his skepticism shouldn't have gone unchallenged, as during his performance in front of a live audience, he would be viciously attacked by Kandu, the orca. Kandu suddenly grabbed Smith with her razor-sharp teeth and dragged him to the bottom of the tank, the crowd watched in horror as Jonathan was thrashed around like a chew toy, only for him to be brought back to the surface and spit out by the orca, leaving a lasting scar on the young trainer. This is the shocking story of an orca attack on Jonathan Smith. Jonathan Smith grew up with a passion for animals that would shape his career path. From a young age, John knew he wanted to work with marine life, as he progressed through school, John's interest only grew stronger. He was the kind of student who was always eager to learn more about the world around him. After graduating, John faced a pivotal decision. He applied for positions at aquariums, research institutions, and wildlife rehabilitation centers around the country, eager to find a job that would allow him to make a difference for marine life. Eventually, he landed a job as a trainer at SeaWorld, a dream come true. At SeaWorld, John had the opportunity to participate in educational programs aimed at raising awareness about marine conservation. He led the interactive presentations for school groups, teaching children about the importance of protecting the ocean and its inhabitants. John's passion for his work was evident in every interaction while training the animals. Kandu number five was born in the ocean but soon found herself captured off the coast of Iceland on October 12, 1977. SeaWorld acquired her shortly thereafter, and she was transferred to their park in San Diego in December of the same year. Kandu's life in captivity began, marked by both moments of training success and underlying struggles. As a dominant orca, Kandu exhibited traits of leadership within her pod. Despite her occasional difficulties with waterworks, she proved to be reliable in her training, earning the respect of her handlers at SeaWorld. Her intelligence and adaptability made her a valuable asset to the park's performances and educational programs. In the realm of motherhood, Kandu experienced both joy and heartbreak. After mating with a male named Winston, she became pregnant with her first calf. Tragically, the calf was stillborn on January 31st, 1986, a devastating loss for Kandu. However, Hope bloomed anew when she mated with Orky 2, a male orca who had recently joined the San Diego Park. Kandu became pregnant again and on September 23, 1988, she gave birth to a healthy female calf named Orchid. The dynamic within the small pod of orcas at SeaWorld shifted with the arrival of Orky 2 and Corky 2, another female orca. Corky and Orchid formed a close bond, much to Kandu's displeasure. As a fiercely protective mother, Kandu struggled to accept Corky's influence on her daughter. Tragedy struck on August 21st, 1989, during a routine performance. As Corky and Orchid performed together in the main show pool, Kandu, seething with jealousy, charged at Corky in an attempt to assert her dominance. In a tragic twist of fate, Kandu collided with the pool wall, fracturing her jaw and severing a major artery. Kandu was rushed out of the show pool, but despite efforts to save her, she succumbed to the injuries due to severe blood loss.
It was a routine day at SeaWorld, with visitors watching the performance of the marine animals. Among the trainers was Jonathan Smith. The atmosphere shifted abruptly when Can Do 5, a notorious killer whale known for her aggression, launched a vicious attack on Jonathan. The audience watched in horror as Kandu grabbed Jonathan with her powerful jaws and dragged him to the bottom of the pool. Despite the excruciating pain and profuse bleeding, Jonathan remained remarkably composed, waving to the shocked onlookers in an attempt to maintain calm. However, the ordeal was far from over as another orchid, Keanu, joined the fray relentlessly slamming into Jonathan as he struggled to stay afloat. For almost two and a half minutes, Jonathan endured the onslaught, sustaining severe injuries, including cuts, bruised ribs, and internal organ damage. Miraculously, he managed to break free and escape from the pool, but the trauma of the attack would linger long after. Reflecting on the harrowing experience, Jonathan spoke of his fear and uncertainty during those agonizing moments underwater. Despite his ongoing recovery, he expressed concern for the safety of others, urging caution in future interactions between trainers and killer whales. SeaWorld, facing scrutiny and criticism in the wake of the incident, asserted that they had implemented significant changes to their practices to prevent such incidents from occurring again. They emphasized their commitment to the well-being of their marine animals and highlighted their efforts in research and conservation. Despite SeaWorld's assurances, the attack served as a reminder of the inherent risk associated with keeping wild animals in captivity. Kandu's violent outburst was not an isolated incident, but rather a manifestation of her distress and confinement, echoing similar incidents involving other captive orcas in the past and even Kandu as well. In the wake of the terrifying incident at SeaWorld, Jonathan Smith, now a former trainer, took legal action against the park, alleging negligence and wrongdoing that led to his traumatic injuries. Smith's lawsuit was filed in San Diego Superior Court and targeted SeaWorld and its parent company, Hard Court Brace Jovanovich, along with 35 unnamed individuals. The lawsuit sought unspecified damages for the harm caused by the killer whales during the performance. Jonathan claimed that despite his lack of formal training to work with orcas in the pool, SeaWorld officials assured him of the safety of participating in the shows, concealing the dangerous proprieties of the orcas from him. The lawsuit alleged various charges against SeaWorld and his parent company, including negligence, fraud, battery, and infliction of emotional distress. Jonathan's injuries, including bruised kidneys, ribs, and a six-inch laceration on his liver, required hospitalization for nine days, but the emotional and physical scars remained. The incident left a lasting impact on John as he continued to grapple with the aftermath of the attack. Smith was employed as a leasing agent after the SeaWorld ordeal and emphasized that his lawsuit was not motivated by financial compensation, but rather by a desire to prevent others from experiencing similar harm. He recounted the experience that earned him the nickname Jonah among his colleagues, reflecting on the moment when he feared for his life as the killer whale dragged him underwater. Despite the legal action, SeaWorld officials remained tight-lipped, but spokeswoman Jackie Hill declined to comment on the lawsuit. Meanwhile, SeaWorld President Robert Gout hinted at the possibility of trainers re-entering the water with orcas, albeit under strict safety protocols. The decision to allow trainers back into the water sparked controversy and raised questions about the park's commitment to ensuring the safety of its staff. The lawsuit shed light on broader concerns about the treatment of marine animals in captivity and the risks associated with close interactions between humans and killer whales. Smith's attorney, Charles Blelier, outlined key allegations of fraud and negligence against SeaWorld, emphasizing the park's attempt to conceal the incident and delay medical attention for Smith. Eventually, the case was settled out of court, but it was only the beginning of the uprising against SeaWorld. Is it too late for SeaWorld's redemption arc? Should they face more legal repercussions because of the countless injuries by trainers and decades of keeping animals in awful environments? We may not have the answers, but maybe another orca attack similar to this one could give the answers. For 17 years, Steve Idell and Kai Diorca 
made SeaWorld shows exciting and tens of thousands of people saw them during the time they performed together. But all that was good came to a crashing end. During one of Steve and Kai's routine performance, Kai stopped following commands of his trainer and began slamming and tossing Steve around like a chew toy as a live audience watched in complete horror and disarray. This is the jaw-dropping story of Steve Ibell, who was attacked by an orca he had trained for two decades. Steve Ibell was a seasoned professional in the world of animal training and behavior. For over 27 years, Steve had dedicated his career to the care and enrichment of marine mammals, particularly killer whales, bottlenose dolphins, and beluga whales. With a bachelor's degree in psychology from the University of Delaware, Steve's journey into the world of animal training began with a solid understanding of behavioral principles. His educational background laid a strong foundation for his future endeavors in working with animals. Steve's career took off when he joined SeaWorld San Antonio as an assistant curator in the zoology department back in 1994. Over the span of 23 years with SeaWorld, he played a crucial role in coordinating and directing animal training efforts, focusing on enhancing the well-being of marine mammals under his care. Steve's expertise extended beyond just killer whales to encompass various cetaceans and pinnipeds, demonstrating his versatility and dedication to the field. His passion for animal welfare and training led him to consult with various organizations, including Service Dogs Incorporated, where he applied the principles of positive reinforcement methodology through his consultations, Steve shared his wealth of knowledge and experience, contributing to the advancement of animal training practices in diverse settings. But his long experience with marine animals didn't protect him from what happened because captive animals are very dangerous. But more on that later. As a professional member of the International Marine Animal Trainers Association, IMATA, and the Animal Behavior Management Alliance, ABMA, Steve remained actively engaged in the community continuously learning and sharing insights with fellow professionals. He presented papers and posters on the behavior and training of marine mammals, further establishing himself in the field. In addition to his hands-on work with animals, Steve also ventured into the realm of education and corporate training. He conducted well-done seminars at SeaWorld, delivering valuable lessons on the benefits of positive reinforcement in both animal care and corporate environments. Steve's ability to translate complex training concepts into accessible and practical insights made him a sought-after speaker among large corporations. After his tenure at SeaWorld San Antonio, Steve took on a new challenge as the Senior Director of Animal Behavior and Trainer at the John G. Shedd Aquarium in Chicago. There, he continued to leverage his expertise to enhance the well-being of marine life and educate the public about the importance of conservation efforts in October 2021, Steve returned to SeaWorld Parks and Entertainment Incorporated as the Vice President of Zoology Operations. It was a typical day at SeaWorld San Antonio, Texas on July 27, 2004, as crowds gathered to witness the mesmerizing performances of the park's star attraction, the killer whales. Among them was Kai, an orca known for his normally gentle demeanor Little did anyone know that this day would take a terrifying turn. As the show The Shamu Adventure commenced, Steve, an experienced trainer with 17 years of animal training under his belt at the time, took to the water with Kai. Their bond seemed unbreakable, having worked together for a decade. But as the performance unfolded, something went horribly wrong. Without warning, Kai's behavior shifted dramatically. Instead of following Steve's commands, the orca began to slam into it with alarming force, tossing him around like a rag doll. The crowd watched in horror as Steve struggled to stay afloat, repeatedly forced underwater by the massive creature. Eyewitnesses recount the harrowing scene, describing how Kai seemed intent on inflicting harm, even attempting to bite Steve during the ordeal. Despite the chaos unfolding before them, SeaWorld staff was powerless to intervene as the attack continued for several minutes. Miraculously, Steve managed to escape the water unscathed, his years of training and composure likely saving his life. Reflecting on the incident, Steve remained remarkably calm, attributing his survival to his ability to remain composed throughout the ordeal. 
He noted that Kai, nearing breeding age, may have been driven by adolescent hormones leading to his erratic behavior. The aftermath of the attacks sent shockwaves through SeaWorld and the broader community. Questions were raised about the safety of the trainers working closely with these powerful marine mammals. SeaWorld swiftly reassessed its policy, implementing changes to ensure the well-being of both trainers and animals. Following the attack, Kai was banned from any future interactions with trainers, signaling a significant shift in SeaWorld's approach to working with orcas. While the incident served as a sobering reminder of the inherent risk involved in training large marine animals, it also highlighted the resilience and bravery of individuals like Steve, who dedicate their lives to understanding and caring for these creatures. Kai is now 32 years old, fully grown, measures about 22 feet in length and weighs over 9,000 pounds. His muscular body, distinctive eye patches, and collapsed dorsal fin are characteristic features inherited from his parents. He was born on December 24, 1991, at the sea land of the Pacific Aquarium in British Columbia, Canada. Decades later, he remained confined within the walls of SeaWorld San Antonio, his life story marked by tragedy and captivity. Kai's parents were Haida II and Tilikum, who were also captive orcas with Rocky Pass, Haida II was captured from her North Atlantic home waters near Iceland in 1982 and later transferred to Sealand of the Pacific, where Kai was born. However, their time together was cut short when Hai II died tragically from a brain abscess in 2001, leaving Kai orphaned at just nine years old. Tilikum, on the other hand, had his own tragic story, and his life became widely known through the documentary Blackfish. Upon his arrival at SeaWorld San Antonio in 1993, Kai's life took a different turn. The care and conditions at SeaWorld offered an improvement over sea land, allowing Kai to thrive and grow. Despite the loss of his mother, Kai continued to mature and develop, forming close bonds with other orcas at the park. However, Kai's transition to SeaWorld was not without its challenges. Several incidents before one with Steve was brushed off, but after that, he was banned from water work. Despite this, Trainers continued to work closely with Kai on land, focusing on his care and training outside of the water. Today, Kai remains a resident of SeaWorld San Antonio, where he spends most of his time with Tua, his half-brother and closest companion. Occasionally, he participates in shows alongside other orcas. Despite the limitations of captivity, Kai is lucky to be active and healthy. Kai formed close relationships with other orcas, but it was his bond with Takura, a female orca transferred to SeaWorld San Antonio in 2009 that became particularly significant. Together, they welcomed a calf named Kyra in 2017, marking the last killer whale birth at any SeaWorld facility. What happened to Steve wasn't the only unfortunate event with orcas in SeaWorld. Their malpractices with these animals sprawled back over half a century, and there were dozens of accidents. These magnificent creatures have been at the center of controversy surrounding SeaWorld. SeaWorld's history with orcas dates back to the 1960s, when they began capturing them from the wild for entertainment purposes. But back then, little was known about the complex social structures and intelligence of orcas, and their capture was viewed as a means to entertain audiences. As the years passed, SeaWorld became synonymous with its iconic killer whale shows. However, behind the scenes, there were questionable treatment and ethical concerns around the captivity of these intelligent mammals. One of the most significant controversies was the practice of separating calves from their mothers at a young age. In the wild, orcas form family bonds with calves staying by their mother's sides for years. However, at SeaWorld, calves were often separated from their mothers prematurely, leading to emotional distress and psychological trauma. Moreover, the confined spaces presented numerous challenges for orcas accustomed to roaming the oceans. In the wild, orcas swim long distances, engage in complex social behaviors, and hunt for their food. However, in captivity, they are confined to small tanks, which can lead to boredom, stress, and even aggression. The documentary Blackfish shed light on these issues, sparking widespread public outrage and prompting a closer examination of SeaWorld's practices. The film exposed the harsh realities faced by orcas in captivity, 
highlighting instances of aggression, injuries, and even fatalities involving trainers. In response to mounting pressures and declining attendance, SeaWorld announced an end to its orca breeding program in 2016. While this was hailed as a step in the right direction, critics argued that it was a little too late. Many question why it took years of public outcries and negative publicity for SeaWorld to acknowledge the harmful effects of captivity on the orcas. Nevertheless, stopping the program didn't prevent numerous attacks in the previous decades, nor the many others before and after that. Steve was lucky, but many others weren't. Should SeaWorld suffer further consequences? How can we prevent malpractice towards animals in what should be educational parks? Is there a functional alternative, or should animals just be left alone? We have our thoughts, but maybe a similar story could give some answers. Shown on screen. <laughs>